Thank you, everyone, for coming, everyone in the room, everyone online. Let's just uh, give us something to check to drink. Um, but I know mean, this is going to be a very sobering, sobering talk, very important one. But in the Zuro, Juro, but in here, Juro, let's get the pronunciation. is a former criminal investigator in the Czech Republic who served on the commission investigating war crimes perpetrated during the Balkan Wars in the 1990s. He's the author of the 2019 book, The Investigator, Demons of the Balkan Wars, which has appeared in Czech and English. It's also been used as the basis for anthropology by Rosa Porto, which is going to continue this month. And a graphic novel that will be coming out as well. Um, next week. Next week. Um, which is a collaboration of the as well. Today he's going to focus on a topic of great interest and concern to me and no doubt to everyone in the room. The impact of propaganda and fake news in wartime. He's also going to talk about the role that the groundwork of explanation of mass graves, identification of victims might play, post-conflict reconciliation initiatives. And we'll discuss the secret operation that led to the first indictment by the International Tribunal since the end of World War II. We're living in a time when there's broad circulation of misinformation and sometimes perhaps uh, such a, an inundation with information in general that we can lose sight of injustice, even when, or maybe particularly at times when it is grotesque. His work recovers stories of people's deaths that might otherwise be lost or forgotten. It holds people accountable for crimes that would otherwise have been committed with impunity, that might have been obscured by the fog of war or have been carried out on such a large scale that it might seem impossible that they could be traced. So we're very grateful for your work. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, if you hear me here, that will be wow. But do you also hear me on, on the in the Zoom? Is it okay? Okay, very good. Uh, yeah, thank you for the invitation. I uh, appreciate very much that I could come to the University of Chicago to do the presentation. It is going to be uh, dark. And uh, there are some images in the in the presentation that are very graphic. And uh, but the investigation of war crimes is not the walk to the rosy garden. And if you want to understand what it means, I actually have to show you the images. So I just want to pre warn you. And actually, there's a slide from when actually it's going to get uh, very graphic. So um, I need to do the thing because it's video and also because it's my obligation. I'm going to tell you two things. You know, my employer allows me to make a public talk or talk to the media only in connection with my work for the International War Crimes Tribunal within the book that I published. So uh, I will not be able to discuss in any detail or any at all the current situation in the world. It means the war in Ukraine and other, other places. I just want to make it clear to you for your questions, I can use the analogy, you know, for what we did and how it could be applied elsewhere. But I will not be discussing the specifics of the war in the Balkans. Uh, sorry, in Ukraine. I don't think what I don't really want to do is this. I haven't been to Ukraine, and it would be completely unprofessional for me. Outside of my obligation not to talk about it, I just don't want to talk about something that I only see on television. So there's also a personal reason as a profession why I wouldn't want to talk about anything that I haven't actually done myself. There's a disclaimer on the screen, which is very important as well. You know, whatever I say here, whatever mistake I might make here, I don't plan it, but if I do make any mistakes, it's my own. They cannot be attributed to the United Nations or to the International War Crimes Tribunal. So all flaws are mine, okay? 
And the other conditions that I actually very happy about, the other condition for me is that I need to promote my book, which I do very happily. And you have to give me 50 seconds of your life because I want to play you a short video for Prince of the War. So I move this screen. It is the story of a Czech investigator who left his job as a homicide detective in Prague to help in the hunt for the criminals of that war. He joined a team of international investigators, lawyers, and prosecutors intent on bringing to justice those responsible for the heinous acts committed in the former Yugoslavia. This story bears witness to the torture and killing of defenseless civilians to finding and exhuming their mass graves, to investigating and arresting the perpetrators, and finally, to bringing them to trial for the International Tribunal in The Hague. Thank you, Louis. One more finding again. and exhuming their mass but graves. But now to do former Yugoslavia. I don't know how much you know about the former Yugoslavia. I'm not going to give you a lecture on history, to bringing them to because trial. I'm sure that this beautiful university has much, much, much more uh, knowledgeable people than me about the history of the Balkans. But very briefly, it was a communist state after World War II. It was uh, led by Josip Broz Tito. He was a communist dictator and uh, actually a very smart communist dictator who managed to portray himself as a better communist than all the other communist leaders in Eastern Europe. And how he did it, you know, he had, he had a charisma, there's no question about it, but he separated himself from Stalin. So the West looked at him as a, as a better communist. And also he had this, uh, he had a yacht where he brought uh, actors from the US and from the Europe. So he was like a showman in the political sense. And as a result of it, he persuaded the Western world to provide him with the cheap money because he was an example of the better communism. And what he did actually to Yugoslavia, for a number of years, he managed to create this artificial uh, welfare for people because it was cheap money. And because it took some time, he actually built an industry you know, people could travel, there were no, like the Eastern Europe had the Iron Curtain, it was impossible actually to move anywhere outside. Yugoslavia had open borders, so many people actually from the Eastern Europe, of Central Europe, were immigrating or emigrating through Yugoslavia, because it was seen as a, as a way out. So, on, on the surface, it was all beautiful, because they live better, they could travel, but it was still communist dictatorship. And it all works to some extent until Tito died in 1980. The system wasn't prepared for succession because it was one man show. And then you have a six republics and each of those leaders all of a sudden wanted to be like Tito. And they, they were afraid of him, they loved him, whatever that was. But now when he was gone, they wanted to be like a Tito. But you can't have six presidents in one country. So they came with the concept of a rotating presidency. And the rotating presidency worked to some extent for some time. And then 1989 came into it, the collapse of communism in Eastern Europe. And now there was no need for better communists. So what happened was the money dried out, political crisis and economical crisis, which led, led to hyperinflation. And basically people lost their savings. There was a thousand percent of inflation, you know, but the, the prices were changing, you know, every day. They, come, they couldn't just come how quickly the zeros were adding to the, to the, to the currency. And what is the solution to it? Now, one of the solutions to this is to find something that can persuade 
your own kind, your own kind people, that somebody else is responsible for it. So you have two main political leaders. You have a president of Serbia, Slobodan Milosevic, that people say he was nationalist, but in fact, he actually wasn't. He was the communist apparatchik who saw that nationalism would be a tool that he could use to get to the power and retain the power. Then you have in Croatia, you have a, a president, uh, Franjo Tuchman. Franjo Tuchman was nationalist. He wanted to create Croatia independently. Nothing wrong with it. Because Croatia wasn't independent for many, many, many years. It was a kingdom and then it be became part of the austro hungarian Empire. And then during the World War II, it was independent state, but it was fascist independent state. So they cannot really go back to it. Similar like in Slovakia, where they, really, when we separated Czechoslovakia, the Slovaks couldn't go necessarily to the state uh, during the World War II because it was also considered fascist. So you had those two strong leaders who wanted to do something that Europe would not allow. They wanted to create Great Serbia and Great Croatia by dividing Bosnia and Herzegovina into two territories. It's very difficult because Bosnia and Herzegovina is very hilly and there are villages scattered around and you have like a Serbian village and you have a Muslim village, Bosnia village and a Croatian village. It's very difficult to, to draw a border in it, which technically would probably be possible in some agreement. But Europe, European community at the time had no time for changing borders. Not because necessarily because of Yugoslavia, but it opens Pandora box. All of a sudden, you have a Sudetland in Czechoslovakia, right? Then you have Basques in Spain, right? Then you have Welsh who want to be independent in the UK. After Czechoslovakia split, you know, Canada, Quebec start talking about independence and run a referendum. Because if Czechoslovakia could do it peacefully, why not someone else? But all those separations like Czechoslovakia was on the border that existed. But these guys wanted to create a border, new border in Bosnia and Herzegovina. So they started the nationalism in the media. Milosevic controlled the media in Serbia. And then the European community said no to this. But when you, when you put the emotions into things, you know, it's very difficult to stop it. You just can't turn it off like a radio. You know, it actually is in the people. And there started to be skirmishes between Croats and the Serbs in Croatia. At the time, Bosnia was still, I'm talking 1991, Bosnia was still okay. They still lived in this brotherhood with immunity. But, but Croatia and Slovenia wanted to get independence because Slovenia didn't want to be in Yugoslavia in the first place. Historically, they never belonged to this. They were Italy and, and Austria. So they clearly wanted to separate from it. In Croatia, the situation was much more complicated because there are huge, at the time, at least were well, huge, Serbian minorities who lived there historically. Here in the Eastern Slavonia, this is the, this is the border between Serbia. So here there was a Eastern Slavonia, Paranya, and then here in Ukraine, so go Ukraine. When the new democratic movements happened in Europe, new governments, new elections, democracy. In those positive moves, also nationalism comes into it. And in Croatia, they accepted the constitution, which overnight made out of Serbs minority in, in Croatia. So they basically said Croats are the constitutional nation and everybody else is a minority which obviously for the Serbs was, was acceptable because they were living in their homeland. They lived there for centuries and they became overnight minority in their own country. So there was a rebellion against the Croatian government. And those, those regions basically were controlled by the local Serbs outside of the government control. It's a complicated issue. I don't want to go into it because you, know, you can actually read it in the history books. But when these two countries uh, 
declared independence in, I think, June 20, 1991, there was the first war in Europe after the World War II, the so-called 10 days war in Slovenia. Slovenia appeared uh, declared independence. There was a, I don't want to minimize it, but there were skirmishes, there was a, some fights. And then there was an agreement between the Slovenian government, the European community, and the Yugoslav army and government of Yugoslavia, and they basically let them go. So they separated in 10 days, it became independent. And the Kuras wanted to do the same thing. You know, Kuras wanted to have independence, but the European community at the time asked them to postpone it. So they did postpone it. And I always, as a joke, say until the 8th of October, because my birthday, and I can remember. So they moved the independence until the 8th of October, so that there will be more time to find a solution between the Kurds and the Serbs in the country. But notwithstanding this, the war broke down, broke out in, in, the, in the region. So, so the initial skirmishes, right, to a full-scale war. Now, Yugoslav army was a federal army, was supposed to be protecting Yugoslavia, should be independent. It was made of all the peoples of Yugoslavia. But when the Slovenia and Croatia declared independence, the staff, the commission staff from the army left because they wanted to create a Croatian army and, and, and Slovenian army. So the leadership of the army became Serbian and Montenegrin predominantly, not 100%, but predominantly. So in the skirmishes, majority of the were Croats, but there were also Serbs, huge minority. And there was also Czechs and Slovaks and Hungarians. Czech and Slovaks actually moved in there because the Bata, the shoemaker, Bata built a huge shoe factory and then brought Czechs and Slovaks from Czechoslovakia. And Hungarians, because it partially it actually belonged to Hungary in a history. So there was a mixed bag population, but majority was Croat and huge minority were Serbs. And see, before the war, beautiful city, very fertile land, the new river, river brings in the, the water and, and the fertility. So it was a very rich area. And then, so the Wi Fi steps into it always. And so from the August, from the August 1991 to 18th November, in about three months, this is what they made out of it. The Yugoslav army on the side of the Serbs by then, you know, didn't want to street do the street by street fights because they were afraid of the casualties. So they used the heavy artillery tanks to level the city. So in three months after the beautiful city, they made this. And uh, there was about 36,000 Yugoslav army and local Serbs against 1,800 Croatian defendants. By the 18th of November, Croats were unable to defend the city. So they surrendered to the Yugoslav army. End of the fight in Bukovar. After that, Yugoslav army was supposed to be protecting all the civilians. If they're unarmed, even if they were fighters, according to the Geneva Convention, they are protected. They are protected. Now, Because of the war in, in, in uh, home Yugoslavia, the UN had to do something about it. At the time, there was also a war in Rwanda, where about a million of people were murdered. So uh, they had to do something about it. So they established the ICTY under UN Resol the Security Council Resolution 827, 1993. They established the, the war crimes tribunal for Yugoslavia and for Rwanda. Now, we'll be again focusing on the Yugoslav tribunal because this is where I work. But they were equally, those are brothers, sisters, tribunals. The same establishments, same funding under the Revolution uh, Security Council. Who was behind the establishment? Oh, come on, country lady. Madame Albright. Madame Obras was very, very much involved in it. And again, explain you why. 
My life on my was a daughter of the Czech diplomat or Czechoslovak diplomat. Sorry, I correct myself. Czechoslovak diplomat who, as a little girl, lived with her dad in Belgrade. So she actually had feeling for Yugoslavia because, as a, as a little girl, she grew up <coughs> part of her life in, in Belgrade. So when the war started, you know, she was at the time the United States permanent representative to the UN. So the top diplomat of the US in the UN. And she was behind establishing the, the tribunal. So there was a big food step of Secretary Albright into the international community. Not first, not the last one, but a very important one. Now, for you to understand, and I think it's important to understand for the story, what the politicians actually thought of how this is going to work. I got about three minute video where Secretary Albright talks as a witness before the tribunal in one of the proceedings. And then she tells basically what the politician thought of the tribunal. I'd like to turn your attention to the issue of another matter you touched on, and that is the creation of the tribunal. Could you share with the judges why the member states of the United Nations voted for the creation of a tribunal, what the concerns were, what issues it hoped to address, what goals it hoped to achieve? Well, I think that um, all of the people that were involved in it, the permanent representatives uh, in the Security Council, as well as the non-permanent ones and others who were not on the Security Council, were very much aware that we were involved in something new, though discussing the Nuremberg precedents, that this was not a um, war of victors, that we were really dealing with a situation that was ongoing, um, that the procedures had to be established that would not only um, identify individual uh, guilt and expunge the collective guilt, but make sure that proper punishment was meted out. And it was, um, in many ways, being present at the creation of a brand new organization. I must say that we ran into a great deal of skepticism. Um, it was easy enough to take the first vote um, in February to get the, um, court, the tribunal created, but nobody really believed that it would work. Um, there were questions about how the judges would be selected. Uh, I must say that um, especially the women permanent representatives at the United Nations wanted to make sure that there would be women judges because so many of the crimes had been committed against women in terms of rape and um, horrendous crimes. And so the judges were then um, selected by the entire UN system. Um, and then the question was how to get a prosecutor, and that was very complicated, and nobody thought that would happen. And then nobody thought that there would ever be a, um, a court that actually functioned that would be set on some what the precedents were going to be. And, um, we then, in May, voted on how the uh, of '93 voted on how the the procedures of the tribunal would work, and then still nobody thought it would work. They said that there never would be any indictees, and then they said there would never be any trials, and then they said there would never be any convictions, um, and there would never be any sentencing. And at each part along the way, um, I would point out that they were wrong. And uh, one of the reasons that I think it is so important that this uh, procedure is going forward is to show that they were all wrong, that, this, uh, that the tribunal is very much a part of the international judicial system that is playing a very essential role, I think, in making sure that this individual guilt is assigned that punishment is meted out, and that there can be reconciliation. I think that was the whole purpose behind having uh, such a tribunal so that there could ultimately be the reconciliation of the various uh, people that were innocent as a part of this. The, the last tribunal before that was the Norbert and Tokyo tribunals after the World War II. They were tribunal tribunals of victors, they call it tribunals of victors. Because after the war ended, the superpowers established the tribunals where they prosecuted crimes of the Germans and Japanese. 
they didn't deal with the other crimes committed by others. And I'm talking about the other nationalities on the side of the fascists, but also the others on the defending side, because the fact you are attacked, it doesn't mean that you are able or willing, that you can commit crimes. But those two tribunals only dealt with the crimes committed by the German and the Japanese. And there was between the 1946, when it finished, to 1993, when these uh, tribunals were established, there was no experience with the international war crimes prosecutions. So there was only a handful of the living lawyers and investigators from those tribunals. So uh, US State Department at the time uh, called a meeting to the State Department where they invited those senior people, senior by age by then, and had the new lawyers who were sent by the American government to the Hague to start the war of the tribunal. So they had a discussion with them about how they went about it. It was the only experience that actually was trans translated or transmitted you know, to the new body. There was no other experience with it. So we started from scratch, basically. So um, the jurisdiction of the tribunal, and I'm not a lawyer, I'm not going to go into it, but yeah. just for you, very breaches of Geneva Convention, violations of customs, laws of customs of war, genocide, and crimes against humanity. This was our parameter that we were. And now, what actually happened? They hired lawyers, investigators, prosecutors, judges to the Hague. And then we didn't want to go there just to sit there and, and do something. We actually wanted to catch the criminals. You know, I spent myself uh, one year in the war. I was working for, as a homicide detective, then I was working for Interpol. And I was seconded to the United Nations, and I spent one year in Sarajevo. And I saw some things there which I really didn't like. And I, I really wanted to actually get on and prosecute those people responsible for it. And the other people might not have the same experience, but they also wanted to prosecute the crimes <laughs> because it was obvious that there were committed crimes on all sides of the conflict. So the example of the crimes, just an example of the crime is this. The book of our hospital, and that's the building. They put the red cross on the roof. I, I just put it as a symbol here. It was on, there was actually a red cross on the roof of the building. And Yugoslav Air Force, Yugoslav Air Force. I remind you, this was the Air Force of the country. It was not a, somebody else's Air Force. It was an Air Force of the country. Just imagine, just for the sake of the discussion, US Air Force in the United States, bombing hospital, right? So the Yugoslav Army Air Force used the cross on the roof of the building as a target, and they dropped a bomb, which actually went, you see, this through the roof, through all the floors, and ended up on the bed of the, of the patient. It didn't explode. So this is actually a violation of the Geneva Convention, which protects the hospitals. This is an example of what was happening in, in the in the former Yugoslavia. There was to what was we were supposed to uh, investigate. Now I move to something else. I said, 18th of November, end of the war. Yugoslav army, Croatian government, Red Cross, and European community met in Zagreb and agreed on evacuation because there was a lot of civilians, all the nationalities, which were not involved in the, in the combat. So they need to evacuate them from the city, which as you saw was completely destroyed. And they agreed on the evacuation on the 19th of November. But the Yugoslav army was arguing that it's too dangerous that they cannot evacuate. So they move it to the 20th of November in the morning. So 20th of November in the morning, the convoy of the Yugoslav army, Red Cross, and uh, European community monitors, among them actually as a Czech guy, uh, Ambassador Kipper, who was actually part of the, of the, of the group, went to the hospital, or they were on the way to the hospital. Now I will show you a scene, it's a short video, what happened on the bridge. The problem is... The problem is... To vidim kako se vojnici šetaju po ulici i da prolaze kamion. Pogledajte, eto tamo.
and Major Sivanchanen, the counterintelligence officer from the Yugoslav army, stops the convoy, arguing that they couldn't go any further because it was still dangerous. And he actually points, there are two bridges like this, and he actually points on the buses which are coming across. So the Yugoslav army stopped them because they wanted to take some people out of the hospital before they allowed the Red Cross in. So they had the five buses, put about 300 people on those buses, two women, the rest were, were men, and put them and took them out of the hospital before the Red Cross was allowed in. Major Sivanchanin, the guy who argued there, was a, the first indictee for our case, right? Now, I stopped this before. Now I have to be very careful how I say it because it's a, it's video recorded. Um, there are two groups of people, right? One, they are fighting each other. One group won, and one group lost. Clearly, like in any other circumstances, when you win something, you celebrate, and when you lose something, you miserable, right? This video will show you the atmosphere in the city. I'm actually using that footage to document how it was at the time for you to understand the next part of the presentation. You see a lines of people in misery walking towards the hospital because they were told by the Yugoslav army that there will be evacuation and they were called to come to the hospital for the evacuation, right? And then you have the other group which actually celebrates the victory. And you will see marching this group there, singing a song, Slobodan, meaning Milosevic, president of Serbia, Sena Salat, we will have a meet, we will slaughter Croats. You know, it might sound like just a song. If it was not in the situation of the end of the war conflict, right? When you have emotions in this, you know, losing, winning, that people, three months of fighting. Serbian television, which was controlled by President Milosevic, came with the news 
the Croats, those who lost the battle, before they surrendered, killed 41 Serbian children. Right? So into that emotions that you have that, right? They announced that the Croats murdered their children. You know, it is an attack on the basic instinct. You know, we all are children of somebody or parents of somebody or both. And then somebody tells you that those people who lost murdered your children. It's a very emotionally charged message. Pa oni su povodili to iz podruma, to je bilo na gomile, spajali su glave, tela, to je sve stravično izgledalo. Fotoaparat, jesli probao da snimiš? Probao sam da snimim usta sam, međutim praštali su meci oko mene i jedan od vojnika je repetirao pušku i naredio ima da se pustim jer bi ja ostalo poginuo. Newspapers were running this. Uh, Reuters picked the news and globally distributed the news without checking it. And when they realized that something's wrong with it, they pulled the news. Right? But the whole world was told that the Croats who lost the battle murdered 41 Serbian children. What was the result of it? This. More beatings. More abuse of women. There are two women among them. Shooting. And the next day, this comes. Jugoslovenski fotoreporter koji je prijavio da je 41 dete bilo masakrirano blizu Vukovara, navodno od strane hrvatskih snaga, opovrgao je danas ključne elemente svoje priče, priznajući da nije video ni izbrojao tela. In a normal world, you know, it'll be bad. But in after conflict, when people have weapons, when people are drunk by the victory, and you have in your hands people who might have done this, you know, it was too late for them to pull the news. It was just too late. 265 of those people in the hunger, they murdered, and they buried them in a mass grave. Now a little bit of the detective work for you. In the films, in the movies, detectives always know where to go. Just imagine if, if the film was telling you step by step how we go about it. You'll be half asleep before you get somewhere with it. So the film actually has to be shortcutted, you know? Detective usually goes, knocks on the doors, they tell him, I don't know, then he goes to the second door and, and he's got the story, you know? You know, if he is an investigator, somebody tells us there's a mass grave somewhere, that you see this, you can see where the grave is, you know? If you just look at the landscape, it could be here, it could be also here, right? Here, see, you can see this? It could be a mass grave. You just don't know. My point, you just don't know. It's very easy to say, very difficult actually to, to find it. So you need witnesses to this. You need witnesses. Then go about a crowd with a Czech background who was among those detained, who was already on the truck being taken to the execution site. And he sits on the truck and he talks to his friends because they all knew each other and saying, nobody's guarding us. Let's jump out of the truck. And this guy next to him says, don't be stupid, they are going to kill us. And he apparently says, what do you think they are going to do to us? Let's jump. And they didn't, and he jumped out of the truck and ran through the cornfields. Eventually he was arrested by the Serbs, but with his name, Novak, he could be just about anything. So he managed to get to Zagreb, survived it. He was the only one who survived. All his friends ended up in a mass grave. This guy, quite small, people say he is Indiana Jones, the real one. True or not, 
but Clyde Snow is actually American anthropologist, first anthropologist, very well known. He was working on Tutankhamun, on Mengele, on uh, the bombing in Oklahoma and other, other, other places. And then before the tribunal was established, Secretary General sent a commission to from Yugoslavia to find out what actually happened there formally. It was led by uh, Mr. Mazowiecki, he was a Polish politician. And then they actually took experts with them and Kleisno was one of them. Kleisno is in Zagreb meeting Zdenko Novak. As Zdenko Novak tells him the story. So Kleisno takes a map of the area and goes to Zdenko Novak around the map. And he, he actually showed, Zdenko showed him how they got off and what he thought they were going through. And so he marks the spot, you know, on the map here. And when he was talking in the court about it, he says, you know, I come from Texas and I live in Oklahoma and the farmers usually drop the garbage at the end of the ravine to protect, the, to defend against the erosion. So he was looking for a wooded ravine in the area close to the hangar and he found this place. So he thought it could be here. So he flew to Belgrade because he couldn't go there from the Croatian side and went from the Serbian side to the, to the, to the location. And it's not good to fight, by the way. He found the grave. See, there's a body on the surface which had a necklace with a Catholic cross and a small tag with inscription which means the God and the Croats. So they figure out that it couldn't be a Serb, right? Because a Serb would never put something like that on his neck. So in October, they came there and they did an initial uh, so inspection of the site with the view that they will come in December and exhume it. And they came in December and started the exhumation. They dug the test range, what you see here on the right. And then the Serbian leadership of the, of the area, this Eastern Slavonia, came to them and said, you are not going to be exhuming it. And they basically pushed them away. So they put a black tarpaulin on the top of it and put the soil back on it. And they put a platoon of Russian soldiers, which were part of the UNPROFOR, United Nations Protection Force, to guard the place. Now in Croatia, rumor that the Serbs would make the deal with the Russians and they will steal the bodies from the, from, this is what happening. It was what was happening from the Yugoslavia. The, the graves were secretly dug out. So there was this rumor coming in, in, uh, in Croatia, that the Russians and the, and, the, and the Serbs will make a deal, right? The other rumor was that those people were not dead. They were actually in the concentration camp somewhere in Serbia and the international community doesn't do anything about bringing them back. So people live out of those false hopes. You know, they were thinking about there's something that actually they could be alive. Now, uh, now we start with the more graphic part of the, the presentation. You now, then the International Tribunal was established. Now we are in 1996, you know, we already were working on the indictments. And the important thing what happened was that Jean-Jacques Klein, Jean-Jacques Klein was American Air Force General, was brought as the UN administrator to the UN in Eastern Slavonia. And he has a very sort of powerful personality. And we came to him and asked him to assist us with the exhumation. And he said, yes, it has to be done. You know, and it was done. He actually put a new platoon of new soldiers from Jordan around it fence it off and then provide the security for us. And then we came as a team of investigators or lawyers and the physician for human rights, which is the NGO from New York, which brings experts from the whole world. And then they came to us as a, as a team to actually do the exhumation. The grave edge is up there somewhere. Okay. 
Yeah. Why would there be still one? I yeah. think it's the string. It could okay. be. Uh -huh. Come here, here's another string. Is it going in the right direction? Yeah. Is it a meter apart? Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. So that should be it. That should be it. How far down below that it's should we... It's 22 centimeters to the first piece of clothing. From the string? Yeah. Okay. Which would be original ground surface. Does it mean that we are in a correct spot? Yeah, well, we knew we had, yeah, we had, yeah, we had yeah. seven meters yeah. to play yeah. with. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, what? Plastic, plastic yeah. bag? Black plastic. And this may be it. Because we did put plastic. Plastic, plastic yeah. bag? Black plastic. And this may be it. Because we did put the plastic. It wasn't disturbed because the plastic was still there. So we knew there was a grave underneath of it. We didn't know how many bodies were in there, but we were assured that the grave wasn't stolen. Is it a meter apart? Yeah. Yeah. From, the, from the dead bodies to expose it. And uh, now the grave itself, the bodies on the top of it were there was a air and water. They decomposed very quickly. So on the on the surface of the grave, there was bones, mostly bones, right? But when you were going down to the grave, because of the clay in the area is very well protect the humans, human remains. So we were actually founding human remains in the intact, pretty much uh, decomposed, but intact. It is very physical to actually remove the bodies from the grave because the, the fluids from the decomposition glue it together. So we need to basically take body by body to keep them as protected as you possibly could because we need to take them to the mortuary to do the autopsies for every single one we had to find out identification and the cause of death this is what we need for the indictment you need to have a sort of legal point you need to know who was killed there who, who was the person and how the person died we took them to the mortuary doctor okay one two three okay let's go get another one Yeah, that might be. Yeah, exactly. We've recovered five bullets from him so far. But the other thing is, um, he's got this bag and this uh, tubing, which uh, looks to me like it uh, would have been a wound drain, a bit of tubing put into a wound to drain fluid or blood out of it. So this was plainly a man who had uh, who had been injured and was still in hospital, suffering the effects of his injury. We've recovered five bullets. You know, I, I don't want to go through that. I just want to show you the samples of it. So we took a guy here, which was injured before, clearly was in a hospital and end up in a mass grave. So we can say, we can say here, from the investigative point of view, that we have somebody who was in a hospital protected by the law, by the Geneva Convention, who ended up in a grave. Right? Now we need to find out who that person was and who brought him there. Have a couple of tattoos on this guy. Yes. Sort of double star of David and a date underneath. Six thirty-two, something like that. And another one up here, but it's uh, got involved with the edifice here and difficult to rub off without removing the tattoo at the same time. But this, I can't quite. Is that thirty-two or fifty-two? Yeah, I put a piece of paper. Names on this. Where is that from? <laughs> yeah, I, I wouldn't. Uh, no, 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 no. That's what the. We need quickly document it because as you expose the body like this, the decomposition actually goes much faster.
So we need to quickly document whatever was on that. All this information was very good for the identification purposes. If somebody had a tattoo on the hands or anywhere on the body, somebody probably from the family would know, right? So it was a thing, whatever we could see, we need to document it. And then also at the time, the DNA was at the very beginning, extremely expensive. You know, one test was about $500 for one test. So if you have 265 uh, bodies in there, just multiply this. But it's not it. You actually need to do the samples from the family. So you need, again, multiply it. So at the time, we decided that we would try all the other means for identification. And only the rest we will do by the DNA, right? So, uh, but we still were taking the, we were still taking, sorry. We were still taking the DNA samples, but from everything. His name is Mihailo Zera. It says he was an ambulance driver at the Hukova Hospital. Mihailo Zera was the name of the person. ID cards on somebody. It doesn't mean that it was actually the person, you know, because you can have my ID card, you know. So, uh, so it was one step. It was good indication who that could be, but it still didn't mean that he could actually say it was Mikhail Zera, right? So this is how Dr. Snow okay, uh, what height 180. Okay, uh, height 180, weight 80, right-handed, brown hair. And he was in the hospital because of a gunshot wound to the upper okay. leg. Now, okay, there's, there's dental information. Let's Missing see. teeth, bridge. The only way we can come up with identifications on these people is to have something in the way of dental traits, physical traits, 
that can tell us beyond reasonable doubt that this particular skeleton is such and such a person and essentially no other person on earth. We start looking at the features that we can collect from old records or from interviews with families or friends, uh, such as uh, estimates of his stature, right or left handedness, things that we can determine from the skeleton. other person on earth. The dry so the bones, now I will bring the humanity into it, personality, investigators. Now, now it comes to a very difficult part of the process. You know, walking on a dead body, is, it might sound terrible to you, but you get used to it. It's just a stench, basically. There, there's nothing moves, it's, it's just a material. It sounds terrible, but that's what it is. But now, we need to bring the families of those people who were killed, who hoped that they are still somewhere in the camps, maybe in Serbia or in Kosovo. And now we give them a pile of bones and the clothing. And you said, it's your son, or it's your husband, or your daughter. You know, it is extremely emotionally charged situation. And then in this particular case, there was a 200 bodies in the grave, 200. So it goes 200 times through bringing the people in and showing them the, the, the bones, saying and trying to persuade them to agree that that was actually the husband, daughter. It went for some time. Out of those 200, 190 three were identified until today. There are still seven people unidentified. And there's a one family who refused to recognize it even after DNA positive testing. So we identify the person, but the family refused to take it as a, as a, as a even the DNA was positive. It depends how people deal with this, you know? You just can't force it on them. It, it's very personal. So back to the, the story. Now we had the bodies. We had uh, three potential suspects for this, not for necessarily the shooting, but for how the people ended that there. It was the Colonel Merksic, who then became a General Merksic. We had who was the commander of the of the JNA, who was responsible for protecting the people. Then he had Major Slavanchanin. You saw him there with the hands up. You know, didn't allow the Red Cross. And Captain Radic, who was the commander of the military police unit, which was bringing the people from the hospital to the Yorkshire side. Right? So there were three indictments, open indictment. We sent the indictment to Serbia, to Yugoslavia, requesting the government to arrest them. Of course, nothing happened. No, we didn't arrest them. No, we had a beautiful prison looking. You know, in, uh, in The Hague. And I always say, Probably better than some student dormitories in some countries. <laughs> but there was nobody in it because nobody wanted to arrest anybody. The countries in the former Yugoslavia, all of them, didn't want to cooperate. You know, they would have arrested Serbs in Croatia and Croats in Serbia, but they would not be arresting Croats in Croatia and Serbs in Serbia. Politically impossible. And if they started arresting the others, they will be accused of not you know, doing the justice. So they didn't cooperate with us. And then you have a NATO forces in Bosnia and Herzegovina. After the Dayton agreement, it was you know agreement between the countries about the peace, which was bro brokered by President Clinton. And then NATO came into Bosnia and Herzegovina with a lot of mites, tanks, and everything. And they basically implemented the agreement. It was an I-4 implementing force and then stabilize the situation, S-4, stabilization force. 
There's a thousands of soldiers in Bosnia and Herzegovina, but they were saying that they cannot do it because their mandate was implement the peace and stabilize the situation. And by arresting the war criminals, they will basically push the population against them, which might cripple the mandate they had. So they didn't want to do it. And there was a lot of pressure on the prosecutor, who at the time was uh, Louis Arbor of Canada, who was the prosecutor. A lot of pressure on her from the international community do something about this. There were 70 indictments by the tribunal at the time, but nobody arrested and nobody wanted to arrest anybody. So we had to do something ourselves. You see the indictees? There's one I didn't mention. Slavko Dokmanovic was the mayor of Bukovar, who we had the witnesses who participate in the beatings of the detainees at Ochara. Not the killings, but the, but the beatings. Right? So, because nobody was arresting anybody, the previous prosecutor, Justice Goldstone of South Africa, he actually came with the idea to start issuing secret indictments. So they will be indicted, but not publicly, which was supposed to help us investigators to approach those people because they wouldn't know that they're indicted and potentially arrest them. Right? So this guy was indicted under secret and under sealed indictment. So it was not made public. And now I go to the next part of my presentation, which is called Operation Little Flower. It was code name for the secret operation named by mayor of New York, La Guardia, because he was nicknamed Little Flower. And because Slavko Dokmanovic was also mayor of the city, we allow ourselves to use the the name Little Flower for the, for the secret operation. You know, I was having coffee, like with you, with a colleague of mine who was investigating crimes committed by the Croats and the Serbs. And she just came back from Belgrade. We couldn't go to Belgrade because we were investigating crimes committed by Serbs on Croats. And we had a coffee in the cafeteria. And she was telling me that she actually came from Belgrade. I said, oh, we cannot go. How was it? I said, we met a number of people, and she said, I met Slavko Petmanovic, who she didn't know that he was indicted because it was sealed indictment. Even within the Office of the Prosecutor, people didn't know who were the indictees. And I was like, oh, really? <laughs> I said, do you have any contact details for, for him? I said, yeah, I've got a telephone number and address if you want it. I said, can you give it to me? And she said, yeah, no problem. I then apologized to her for that, but I couldn't tell her, right? So she gave me the, the, the telephone number and the address. And I go to a colleague of mine, a lawyer, American lawyer, Clint Williamson. And I said, Clint, what about if he can try to trick Dokmanovic to bring him to Hungary or to Eastern Slavonia, which was controlled by the UN, by this general crime, and uh, under pretense that he mistaken the crimes committed by Croats and the Serbs. And Clint, being a very smart man, he got it quickly. You know, we went to the chief uh, investigation and then we went to the chief prosecutor, Louis Arbor. And we told her the story about what possibly could be done. And then, like today, I see this. There was a round table. She was sitting at the head of the table and we were sitting around. And, uh, and she said, what could go wrong? And Clint says, no, many things can go wrong. Nobody ever tested it. Nobody ever arrested somebody like this. It was only for the first time that the international community would be arresting somebody like this. There are some precedents before, right? Eichmann, for example, by Israelis. No, but it was not international tribunal. It was a country. Right? So there was a completely new situation. So she, Clint says, you know, somebody can get killed. You know, somebody can get injured. It could be an international incident out of this. And then there was a silence. And then we Arbor said, if nobody else is willing to do it, we've got to try ourselves. And she gave a green light to us to set up the operation with the flower where we would go to Dokmanovic under pretense that uh, we are investigating crimes committed by the 
Cyprus and the Serbs and try to persuade him to come with us to Eastern Slavonia, which was the better option. We, you know, Hungary would be more complicated because it would be international extradition and things, you know, in Eastern Slavonia, which was controlled by the UN, we had a direct jurisdiction over this. So get him to, to Croatia, to Eastern Slavonia, to show us where the crimes were committed by Kurds and the Serbs. He initially agreed with it. So uh, my colleague, Kevin Curtis, actually went to his home and uh, started interviewing with him as a witness with the idea to persuade him to go in the car with him, cross the border to Croatia to show us the places. And then the marriage changed his mind. He said, you know, it's too dangerous because Croats would arrest him. Because Croats at the time started to control the borders, even though it was the area still controlled by the UN. And Kevin told him, no, we can guarantee you that the Croats would not arrest you. Because we had no interest allowing Croats to arrest him. And he never asked us not to arrest him because he didn't know he was indicted. So we didn't lie to him because he never asked the question. Now, it was an important point eventually in the legal proceedings. We never lied to him about it. He just didn't ask the right question. So it's a long story, actually. It's a big part of my book describing it was a unique operation. So what happened was eventually when Kevin was leaving the home, Dirk Manovich and his daughter came there and then his wife was there and they said, you know, we have a house in Eastern Slavonia. We would like to sell it, but we can't go. And Dirk Manovich was saying, you know, when I was with Mayor Bukovar, I had a meeting with General Klein every day, every other day. Now I can even can't call him you know, from Serbia. And so Kevin is very bitty. You now he said, maybe I can help you to set up a telephone conversation. So he went to Klein and asked him whether he would allow to use his name for this. And he said, of course, he used different language I'm not going to use here, but he says basically, yes, can be done. So Kevin went back to the house of, of Dirk Manovich, finished the interview with him, gave him the telephone number, and told him to call the special assistant of Klein to set up the meeting. And Dirk Manovich indeed actually called, set up the meeting. And then with the idea that he will go to meet Klein, we will provide the VIP escort for him. And he will take him to Klein to, to talk about the Serbian property. The only thing what he had to do, which was critically important, he had to cross the Serbian border. There's a bridge, there's a Danube river, there's a long bridge. And we needed him to cross the checkpoint to leave Serbia so that he wouldn't be kidnapped from Serbian territory. And it was all set up. You know, here's a, again from the cartoon because there's no pictures, you know, Kevin is in a family, you know, of, uh, of, of uh, Dirk Manovic talking about, uh, you know, the thing and then we used a Polish special police unit, just like a Delta Force. You know, they actually were trained by Delta Force and the SAS for, for this operation, because we need to have a unit which will be speaking one language. There were some other forces, UN forces in the area, but they couldn't communicate with each other. They were like a Belgians and, and Slovaks, and, but we need to have a unit that will be able to communicate with each other. So we used the, it's called Grom, the special police of the Polish army of police. And then there was a the camp which we used for the arrest. We blocked the road. It looks like an accident. The car had to turn into the camp. And then you see what happened there.
Igor Ivanovich. My name is Vladimir Turov. I'm an investigator of the office of the prosecutor of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. Gospodin Dokmanović, ja se zovem Vladimir Turov. Ja sam iz Fraštine za bilo tužitelja Međunarodnog krivičnog suda za bivšu Yugoslaviju. You are charged in an indictment and named in an arrest warrant issued by the tribunal. Vi se teretite u optužnici i vaše ime je navedeno u nalogu za hapšenje koje izdao Međunarodni krivični sud. You are charged with the great breaches of the Geneva Conventions, crimes against humanity and violations of the laws or customs of war for your role in the beatings and killings which occurred at Ovčara Farm near Vukovar on the 20th of November 1991. Do you understand? Optuženi ste za teške porede ženijevske konvencije, zločine protiv čovječnosti, kršenje ratnih zakona i vratnih običaja, dok vaše uloge u tučenju i ubijanju na farmi Ovčara i u zemlji Vukova 20. oktobera 1991. godine. Da li ste razumeli ovo što vam je rečeno? Razumeo sam, ali to nije isto. I understand, but it's not true. Good chance for you. Yeah, that's not true. and he was put in the car and driven to the airport where we had a Belgian Air Force aircraft park in Parma. And uh, so we got there with the Polish Special Forces still with us. We got to the aircraft. It was a pre-negotiated takeoff for the, for the airplane. So it was all ready for us. It was all communication. We were getting there. He got there, he got out of the car, there was a doctor who actually did a physical on him that he was able to, to travel, just to make just to make sure. Colin Williamson as a lawyer signed the takeover of the prisoner, you know, from the special police, and then car with the Croatian policeman came on site. And they said, who are the people? So we need to put the names on the manifest. You know, so we put our names on the manifest, plus one. And they said, who is that guy? He said, he can't tell you. And within the five minutes, there was a call from the operations, you know, flight control, canceling the takeoff. So we were stuck at, again, 40 degrees. You know, everybody nervous. We were surrounded by the Polish, up to teeth armed, you know, special troops, and with no jurisdiction, because we were already on the territory of Croatia, free Croatia. And those three policemen with the handguns, handguns, they actually had a jurisdiction that was good enough to prevent us from the takeoff. But Clint actually telephoned Deputy Prime Minister of Croatia, Ivica Kostovic, who we knew from the exhumation, and he told him about the problem. And Ivica Kostovic basically, he passed the phone with the police, Clint, and there were some talks in Croatia. And about 10 minutes later, the pilot told us that, you know, we got the renewed permission to take off. So everybody in the aircraft shut the door, engines, and it was like a fighter pilot stop, like this and like this, <laughs> to get out of the airspace to Hungary. Because we were concerned that the crowds might change their mind when they found out what happened. That they will change their mind and they will order the pilot to land back in Croatia which would cause all sorts of problems, you know, with us basically taking a prisoner. He was a Croatian citizen. He was a Serb, a Croatian citizen, taking him against his will out of Croatian territory, right? So we, uh, we managed successfully this. We got on the way, we flew to the Hague, and then Dr. Maric asked for a cigarette. And he said, I need to smoke, I have a cigarette in my bag. And Kevin said, you get my cigarette. He said, I'm not smoking from you because you tricked me. 
my wife is cooking dinner for you because the idea that I would go back home. And, and Kevin said, I'm not, I'm not going to give you the bag. If you want a cigarette, you can have mine. And then sometime later, Clint Williams and the lawyer gave him an indictment in Serbia. So he went through the indictment. He said, give me the bag, I need to put it in. He said, no, I'll put it in. We didn't know why he was asking for the bag until he got to the prison. You know, he landed in, in uh, an Air, Air, Air Force base met close to the Hague in, uh, in Holland. There was a police took us you know, to uh, the prison. And then as a good policeman, you know, we were handing over the personal things to the guards so they can actually you know, mark it. And Kevin being a good English policeman who never had a gun in his hand, put a hand into the bag and pulled the revolver. There was a loaded gun in the bag. That's why he wanted the bag so that he can get the gun. So he didn't get it. You know, he was brought before the judge and the defense was arguing that he kidnapped him and they wanted him to release. It went before uh, Judge McDonald, it was American judge. There was a whole hearing against, it's completely, I don't want to go into it, but the defense lawyer of Dr. Maravich made a mistake, which the American lawyers didn't understand why he did it. He actually put him twice, he put him twice on the stand as a witness, right? And in this pre-trial proceedings, he put Dr. Maravich on the trial to expose him to the cross examination. And this is actually, it went very wrong for Dr. Maravich because Clint Williamson, who was the prosecutor, asked the question, when did you feel being arrested? Right? And Dr. Maravich said, when they pulled me out of the car. So under oath, in front of the judge, he testified that he felt arrested only when the SWAT team pulled him out of the car, which was well on the verge of Croatia under the UN control. Had he said that he felt arrested when he actually got into the car, it would be a completely different story because what we didn't know at the time that the border between Serbia and Croatia is in the middle of the river. So even though he passed the checkpoint, the escort was still technically on the territory of Serbia. But he under oath in court proceeding, he said he felt arrested only when he was pulled out of the car, which was on the territory controlled by the UN. So the decision was that he actually was legally arrested and it went through the through trial proceedings and then uh, it's a different story. What actually happened, Justice, goes, Justice uh, Arbor could go to NATO and says, look, these guys from my office, a handful of them managed to arrest the war criminal without anybody get killed, anybody got injured. And now you are telling me with thousands of troops in Bosnia and Herzegovina, Herzegovina, you cannot do it. So she had a big stick in her hand, basically trying to push luck with the international community. You know, our arrest was the first arrest of the indicted war criminal after the World War II. It was a precedence they couldn't ignore. So about two weeks later, British SAS went to Priedor in Bosnia and Herzegovina there were three indictees under seal for genocide. So they tried to arrest them. They arrest one. The second stupid they put up at them, so they killed him. And the third one ran into Serbia, where eventually he was arrested and prosecuted for the genocide. Well, for that little. And uh, he had a walkman. And a walkman for you guys. It's like an iPad, but in the, in the batteries, right? Yeah. So, so here is Walkman, no batteries. And I was coming out of the hotel every morning, and he was there begging for the batteries. Sir, sir, you know, you promised the batteries. And I promised, but I always forgot it. You know? And next morning, I go out of the hotel, and the boy is there again, begging for the batteries. So I always promised myself that next day I will bring them. Right? And then one day, I come. But Sarajevo has yet to enjoy full peace. Unpredictable sniper fire continues to be a daily menace, even on the tramway system, 
And since mid-November, the number of rocket and mortar attacks into built-up areas has increased dramatically. As everybody knows, that around the area, around the Holiday Inn, this most dangerous part of, of town. The other dangerous part is Dobrinya, an area around the airport. Meanwhile, the terror on the streets continues unabated, and the number of deaths and injuries is again on the rise. You know, it was the first, for the first time for me. I was a homicide detective. I saw many dead people, but I didn't know any of them. You know, I was called on the side and I saw dead people. Again, material. This was the first time in my life I actually saw the, the person who I knew kill a child with a bullet in his head. It was not collateral damage. You know, in a war, bad things happen. Something explodes and no shrapnel kills somebody. In this particular case, it was deliberate attack on a child. And I just couldn't understand why somebody would pull the trigger on a, on a child. Until later, I saw the video where they were broadcasting on the, on the television that the other side was throwing kids as a feed for the animals. So I'm not saying necessarily that there was a consequence, but I'm just showing you, you know, how you can persuade the other side to commit the crimes like this. Then you feed them with the information, which is very false. There's another one. This is a painting by Ursh Predic, who is a Serbian painter. And it's called Orphan on the Grave of His Mother. It is a Serbian paper from 1994. It was printed. See, it's the same thing. But it has a different description to it. This is the child crying on the grave of uh, parents who were killed by the Muslims, you know, by the Bosnians in the Bosnian Herzegovina, just before the Sarajevo, uh, before the Chevron inside incident. And this, this is the consequence of it. I'm not, 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 not making direct consequence, but I'm just telling you if you put something into people's head, then you can expect this. Radio Television Serbia apologize for this. 24th of May, 2011. 20 years later. 20 years later, they apologize for that. And this is apology, but it is not. It's kind of apology for it. Now, somebody can say they couldn't apologize, you know, because Milosevic was still in power. Well, the military was arrested in 2020. Yeah. It took them another 11 years before actually they could have the apology. So they admitted spreading the, the rumors, spreading the fake news. Now, I'm getting to the, the end of my presentation, which I end up on a, on a short commercial about my. Uh, my uh, Graphic novel, if I may.
outside of it. International justice is very expensive. You now, for establishing of any court or any tribunals, we need to have basically two things political will and money. Just for as an example, the tribunal operated from 1993 to 2017. During that time, you know, we indicted and processed 100, 161 people. I think 90 plus were actually prosecuted. The rest of them were acquitted or they died. So 161 people from 1993 to 2017. It cost international community $2 billion. $2 billion. So we're putting hand up, you know, for establishing the tribunal. It's a political will, but there must be a commitment. There must be a commitment to pay for it. You can't, in the middle of it, decide that you want to pursue it any further. Just imagine what you do with the people. You have a people who are accused of genocide or war crimes, and they need to be prosecuted, they need to clear their names. You can't stop it in the middle. So it's a huge commitment. The tribunal was successful. There's no question about it. It's, a, it's a recognized as a success. Now you have to ask again two things. First thing from the big picture, was it successful? Yes. It removed the politicians from the political uh, arena, you know, Milosevic and Karadzic and the others. And others were afraid that I was going to be arrested. So it helped. Now you have to ask yourself another question. For you as a person, if somebody comes to your home and kicks the door open, and tell your parents, I rape your sister, and you lose overnight everything what you had in their life. And then 10 years later, they prosecute somebody 15 countries away for crimes. And not, not, maybe not even those who actually did it, because we prosecuted people responsible for it, not necessarily the killers. Would that be for you? Would it be a justice? You know, because people look at the war crimes as something distant. This is the same like a murderer here across the street. Somebody did something very bad to you and uh, on a huge scale. And then you need to look whether the justice that was delivered to us, to the individuals, was good enough. So there's a big difference between the personal satisfaction with the work of the tribunal and with the international satisfaction of this. You know, people are asking, would it we wouldn't do it. No, just we wouldn't do it. You know, we wouldn't do it. And I always say, you can't say this because you don't have the experience with this. Because people react differently to the situation where something happened to somebody else and when something happens to you. And the reconciliation issue, you know, we all, because it doesn't touch us, unless you are somebody from the former Yugoslavia, it didn't touch us. You know, we come and said, you know, there must be reconciliation, people have to start living together, it's great. But it's very difficult because the people in Yugoslavia were affected by this. You know, their families were murdered, property was damaged on all sides of the conflict. And now only 30 years later, we are trying to persuade them that they actually need to live together. I always give an example from Czechoslovakia. You know, the Sudetland, after World War II, part of the population of the Jimbo population was moved out of Czechoslovakia based on the legal decision to actually move them out. The way of how it was done is a different story. A lot of crimes were happening actually on the move of the people, right? It was not that long ago there was a presidential elections in Czechoslovakia and Czech Republic, which were actually affected by the story about the student lands, you know, about one of the candidates actually kind of agreeing with this or apologizing, you know, to the Germans, you know, for the move. So we are talking about from 1945 until it was like 2000, maybe 10. There's a long time period when passed. None of us remember this. Now, even my parents that I don't remember, and I'm very old, what happened in the land, it still affects the population. And now we are asking people in Yugoslavia 30 years after the conflict, where most of the population actually remembers what happened there, to 
take your hands, as I said, and dance on the, on the grass and be happy again, brothers and sisters. It just doesn't work like this. You know, the expectations of the international community on the local population is extremely high and it is not reasonable. You know, we need to give the people time to heal the wounds of the war. It takes a long time. This is our wrap up presentation. Thank you for listening to me. If you have any questions, I will try to answer them. Um, let's take a yes. Yeah, if there are questions. Yeah, well, this, any questions? Any questions? Did they choose when they're saying like the people on the bus? Did they choose mostly men and two women for a reason? Or was it just like a few minutes? It's very complicated question, very good question. Very complicated questions because among those people were the Croatian defenders, but they were also civilians and they were also staff from the hospital. One of the women, one of the two women, was the wife of the Croatian defender, the commander of the Croatian forces. So it was a mixed bag. You know, you can't really say that it was clearly a key how they were collecting them. Okay? There was a mixed bag, mixed bag of defenders of the city normal civilians, wife of the commander of the Croatian forces. So there was not a key for this. And even when they got to the Yugoslav barracks, some people were taken out of the buses and returned back to the hospital and they survived because they were like, a, they had ID cards of the, of the staff from the hospital. So it was not organized, organized the way, but they were all Croats. And there was a reason for that, that they were on the buses, but we never actually came to the bottom of the what kind of key for the selection was. We only found out who these people were after the fact, and we knew that some were in the army and surrendered weapons. But by surrendering the weapons, they automatically get under general permission protection because there were no more fighting. So it was one answer to your short question, but we never came to figure out the key for the selection on the buses because the it was a mixed bag of the people. Yes. Uh, in the in the little part, uh, Misha, you mentioned that there are a lot of co uh, collaborations between different countries and officials, and I'm wondering if, uh, first of all, if this uh, are there any difficulties uh, in uh, building the, the, the uh, building people's uh, working together? Like, uh, do different countries or officials have different opinions about uh, how to work or what kind of things we should do or we should not do at certain point? Yeah, I'm just wondering if there are any uh, difficulties or experiences in this regard. And, Secondly, does this kind of, uh, because you mentioned that this is a very special case, uh, is this case set up, uh, did this case set up the precedence in the future for countries, uh, for European countries to set up this kind of collaborations uh, when it comes to similar cases in the future? Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's extremely difficult to get a political consensus on establishing the tribunals, you know? The establishment of the of the Nuremberg and uh, and Tokyo trials after the World War II was a complicated matter, which eventually was resolved in uh, London Charter, which was signed by four superpowers: it was the U.S., Britain, France, and Russia, Soviet Union at the time. And there was a big difference is what they expected from that, you know, from more radical way how to deal with the criminals to more civilized, if I can, uh, on the spectrum. Very difficult. Very similar it was when they established the tribunal for the Yugoslavia and for uh, for Rwanda. It was a big negotiation, you know, between the people the figures, because if it goes through the UN Security Council, there were five countries with the veto power. China, Russia, US, UK, and France. 
and any of those can veto. No, so I'm not going to be discussing the current situation, but if you look into the media and read about what's happening right now, you will see that there's a country that is vetoing all the resolution that might be going against that country. I don't want to be specific, I just can't do it because of my job. But there's a necessary political consensus to do something through the UN Security Council, right? And without the decision by the council, you can establish the tribunals. So the other option outside of the UN was the Rome Agreement, which established the International Criminal Court, which is in The Hague, the same as the ICTY, but that court is not UN court. It's an it's a agreement among the countries, you know? The problem with that is the big countries didn't sign for it. So US didn't sign for it. China didn't sign for it. Russia didn't sign for it. So uh, I think the UK and France did, if I'm not mistaken. Please correct me if I'm wrong. The point is, it is not universal because some of those countries are outside of the jurisdiction of this. So it's a big complication, you know, how you can then use that court for the investigation of war crimes on a territory which is not part of, of, the, of the International Criminal Court, right? So there was a lessons learned from the process from Nuremberg to ICTY and now to the ICC. This always requires a political agreement. It, as I said, it needs money. So the countries need to commit money into it. But if you're asking about the cooperation within the structures, there's no problem. You know, I was from Czechoslovakia, from the Czech Republic, and then my best colleagues were two Brits, American lawyer, Canadian analyst. They came from a different experience, but the same job, basically. And within two weeks, we just picked together. So it's, 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 it's not a technical problem, you know, how to investigate the, the war crimes. Now, there's also experience with this, because after the ICTY, ICTR, there's also a court for Lebanon, so there's a lot of people with experience of investigation of the war crime and prosecution of it. The problem is not on the, on the working level. The problem is on the political level to make the agreement whether they want to prosecute something and pay for it. You also spoke about there needing to be, in addition to the political agreement, the financial agreement. When this was decided, sort of, to um, prosecute these crimes. How much do the country know they will be paying and how is this agreed? And I don't know, you can't speculate, but um, in sort of in these kinds of agreements, how much do countries know they will pay and agree sort of proportion that they will pay? Yes, uh, I didn't laugh at your question. I laughed at the whole topic. They didn't know how much it's going to cost. Mm -hmm. They just did not. Because the first budget for the ICTY, if I'm not mistaken, don't take me, you know, by word, I think it was like a half million dollars, right? Just to administratively, you know, come together. And then when it was in full force, it cost hundred million dollars a year. Hundred million dollars a year when it was in full force. There was about thousand employees of the tribunal from the prosecutor judges. But you know, have to remember, you also have a security, you need to have buildings, you need to have witness protection. You know, it costs a lot of money. And also for the international tribunals, for the law enforcement here, the law enforcement just here in the US, if somebody commits a crime and you have a witness, you need to put him in witness protection. So you take him from Chicago to California, right? And put him in some small village, you know, and nobody would ever find him. Like you know, in a movie, yes, but in reality, unless he does something stupid, they wouldn't find it. The tribunals don't have territory, right? So we also need witness protection for the for the witnesses, but we don't have a country for that, right? So we need to go to the countries and negotiate with the countries to take those people in witness protection. Just imagine how difficult it is to persuade the country to take on their soil somebody who is potential murderer. Because the witnesses are not the good people, very often. The witnesses are very often bad people, which are better than the bad people. And you need them for the trial because you cannot prosecute anybody without witnesses. 
it all costs money. So the commitment at the beginning, I just go back to your question, the commitment at the beginning was very little, right? But but they couldn't stop it. So they had to actually year by year agree on increasing the budget until it actually stabilized in about 100 million a year. Then it went down. Now it's much, much less with the residue mechanism. But now they know how much it costs. Now they know how much it costs. So any commitment at right now is much more difficult because, because they know how much it will cost if they put a hand up for it. Yes, please. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I just have a question. Now. Just wait for the microphone, please. Oh, okay. Because there are also people online. So there was what? There are people online. Oh, that's online. why. Okay. Can anybody hear me? One, two, one, two. <laughs> um, so I was uh, interested in the question about uh, defining fake news. Mm -hmm. I think it's crucial. As an historian, I, I, I worked on the development of fake news and propaganda in the 19th century. 19th century. So of course, my uh, evidence are indirect accounts, no mm -hmm. testimonies, and you have a more direct idea. But you, you presented cases of uh, uh, blatant, even stupid mm -hmm. uh, manipulation or uh, uh, like this can be very quickly. Mm -hmm. and, and, and most of the time, actually, the, the fake news uh, always lies between, are very difficult to decipher quickly, and they play on the idea of time, mm -hmm. which is the most time spent believing the fake news, and, and then feel like it's too late to come back to the truth. Mm -hmm. It's just a question of timing. Uh, so that both sides are always exploiting the gray area between what's true and what's not true. And that gray area is also exploited by the... Well, a good example is when you talked about those bodies. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes some people were shot in the back, but also were hospitalized. Mm -hmm. So sometimes people can be shot being dead already. Mm -hmm. So the, the actual conclusion be very hard to, to mm -hmm. come. Same as the last example with the hospital call. Even if you go to military justice that added the type of say, hospital companies, shields for military operation and that justified uh, bombing of certain hospitals that are wrong, even here really in the Gaza economy that justified bombing. But by the time you prove what may not be, sometimes it's too late. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just an idea of public opinion. Mm -hmm. Public opinion is deciding in the moment to get this emotion and to think what's right and what's wrong without knowing, without the truth. Mm -hmm. And this question of uh, fake news is a question of the battle of uh, propaganda and public opinion. Who wins public opinion? Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned indirectly, there is maybe this country with doing veto, but this country is losing the war on public opinion, is crushed by another propaganda that mm -hmm. uh, maybe. Right side, but still is completely choosing what's right and what's not right. I think uh, just the answer to this, I don't know the answer exactly how to modify or how to identify, but if you look at Goebbels, you know, head of the propaganda of the Nazi of Germany, you know, there's an attribution to him saying that a thousand times you sell the lie to so save the lie, people start believing it. I think this is how the propaganda works, you know. And again, without looking into any specific country today, which I cannot do, but if you look at the television, you see the dead bodies in the streets, you know, and the comment commentators and you know, the reporters are talking about genocide because it sounds terrible. Now, genocide is a very specific crime, which is very sort of specific definition in the Geneva Conventions. But that body on the street, no matter how terrible it is, it still doesn't mean that it's a crime, war crime. You know, in a war conflict, you know, there could be a legitimate target. You know, there might be a military target and the rocket go astray and, and explode and kill people. You know, it doesn't necessarily, necessarily mean that it was a war crime. It is a killing, which is terrible. But the media, of course, on all sides manipulates these things. So if you li listen to the two stories about the same thing, you hear completely different stories. This is the manipulation of, of the, by the media. And these days, I think it's much more dangerous than it was in the past, because now we all have these things in our pockets. You know? Thank you, Steve Jobs. I love you. But the problem with that is, you know, we get the information instantly. And many of us, without critical thinking, we immediately can't believe what we see. 
We actually don't go to the sources. It's so dangerous. It's so dangerous just to look at the headlines of things and believe that it's not being true. You know, it's again, I, I don't know the answer to your question. I'm just going to use your question to demonstrate, you know, how the propaganda now is much more sophisticated than it was in the past, because now they use those technologies to get in our, you know, in our bubbles. You know, we all are on Facebook and TikToks and all the other things where we are having a group and everybody hears the same thing because we are in that group. So we hear the same thing, right? We hear what, what they want us to hear. And unless we actually go and check on it, we can be easily manipulated. So it's extremely dangerous. And in some, actually, some countries, they only teach students about the critical thinking and some countries don't. And I think it's an extremely important subject actually to teach. Okay, I, this will last one. Last question. So you talked about the importance of money and political will. I want to focus on political will. Uh, you talked about Madeline Albright playing a role because she was personal to her. Mm -hmm. And they will also reach this own acquaintance government in action in Rwanda and that mm -hmm. was the that was the driving force mm -hmm. behind this uh, establishment of international tribunal. So I wonder what are other factors that can help create this political will and can uh, you know, last for the decades. And uh, focusing on the issue in uh, Ukrainian war, the Izium and uh, Bucha, the exploitation of dead bodies. And it's possible that it could be done by the Ukrainian government. So what what would be the case for creating international tribunal uh, for, for, for the investigation afterwards, mm -hmm. uh, given that the site is within the Ukrainian government's control? Yes. Uh, as I said, I'm not going to be answering the directly question from Ukraine. I just can't because of my employee. But I would do just the you know there is existing court. The International Criminal Court that conducts the investigation in Ukraine now. Right? So there is international investigation into those crimes. You know? How is going to actually result in indictments if ever? How is it going to be prosecuted if ever? I don't know the answer to it. But there is a court. You don't need to create a new one. There is an existing court that actually can investigate it. I think that the, what is critically important now is to collect the evidence. Because the evidence disappears. You know, you need to have evidence collected so that if we manage to get into the prosecution, we actually have evidence to present. With the time between now and the establishment of the court, my result in the loop that you lose the, the evidence. You know, people's minds are changed by the news that they are listening to. We saw it in our own eyes in Yugoslavia. Because they were living in the camps together. So the, the, the story that they actually saw was influenced by, by the other people. And further you get, you know, from the moment when it happens to the time in your interview, more the story could be manipulated intentionally or just by us, you know, forgetting things. So the most important thing is now to collect the evidence. And then we had to hope that there will be a prosecution sometime in the future. But without the evidence today, there will be no prosecution at, at the end. I don't have a better answer for you, unfortunately. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Well, it's good to thank Matthew Weston for running the technology uh, as computers at series for organizing and, and checking up for inviting our speaker and doing a much more organizational work. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to us.